Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Joining us today is Bill Glaude, Program Officer of Philosophy at the Institute for Humane Studies. He holds a PhD in philosophy from Tulane University. Today we're going to be talking about libertarian paternalism, but let me start maybe a little bit broader than that and just Within the context of what we're going to talk about today, what do we mean by paternalism? Great. So paternalism, as I understand it, typically involves some kind of mechanism, either coercion or manipulation, um, that, uh, that the aim of paternalism is to uh, usually prevent somebody from harming themselves, perhaps in ways that they're not aware of, perhaps in ways that they are aware of. So uh, the traditional sort of notions of, of paternalism, typically like laws about uh, you know mandatory seatbelt laws or mandatory helmet laws, maybe drug laws, at least uh, the paternalism intent is to keep people from acting in ways that uh, will be harmful to themselves. So that's sort of the broader notion. Uh, usually what people understand by paternalism is uh, a coercive aspect. Sometimes people talk about paternalism in an even broader sense where they mean like if you're just uh, you know, trying to persuade somebody, you're trying to um, – uh, you know, talk them into doing something uh, that they otherwise wouldn't wouldn't do, but uh, it, it usually involves something like coercion. And in the case of libertarian paternalism, I, I'm going to argue uh, in many cases it involves manipulation, if not coercion. So the libertarian factor, though, you have obviously this sort of seemingly oxymoronic thing, libertarian paternalism. You're trying to keep someone from hurting themselves, but through libertarian means. Yeah, right. So the promise of libertarian paternalism is that you can sort of uh, influence the, uh, you can arrange the, the choice architecture, sort of the, the frame in which people uh, make choices and, and make decisions and, and, and act on those, uh, without taking away, without forbidding any options, without uh, taking away their freedom of choice. So. One understanding, sort of the maybe main plank of understanding coercion is that you're restricting freedom of choice. Uh, but with uh, libertarian paternalism, the idea is that, well, people have the right to opt out of the, uh, the particular, uh, say, nudge or uh, intervention in, into the choice architecture. But the idea is that usually you're, you're looking to exploit um, one of their uh, heuristics uh, to get them to maybe act in a particular way. So a common example of uh, libertarian paternalistic intervention would be, say, um, the, the default enrollment into a retirement account. Uh, so usually uh, you know, there's sort of studies been done where people basically, if, if you don't you know, if, the, if the default situation is that uh, you are not – you have to opt into a retirement account, people uh, don't do it, at least not initially. Uh, they, they just sort of go with the flow. They, they have you know, status quo biases or just inertia. So if you switch the default, if you have them already sort of enrolled and they, they have the, the option to opt out, uh, most people don't. They just remain enrolled. So You mentioned the word nudge, which is I think an important part of this. Uh, where does that – Come yeah. From. So nudge, um, I don't know exactly where it originated, but it's been popularized by uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler. They had this best-selling book Nudge uh, back in two thousand eight, uh, and the the way so the the. The way they define nudge is very broad. It's, it, it's any aspect of the choice architecture that can influence people's behavior in a predictable way without forbidding their options or significantly altering their economic incentives. But that's like a really broad sort of notion. So there's lots of different things that can be nudges. It can be you know, self-imposed or imposed by somebody else. It doesn't even have to be imposed by a person. It can be sort of just a feature of the environment in which you're making uh, decisions. So uh, – and this may come up in our discussion, but uh, nudges can mean sort of just a, a, a wide variety of different kinds of things. Some of them, which I think are innocuous, other things which I think might be more problematic when it comes from uh, concerns about either autonomy or uh, sort of respect for people's preferences. Your retirement account example of you know we just start by the person contributing to a retirement account, and then they can opt out if they want to. That's something that's happening at the level of the employee-employer relationship. But is this is this paternalism a theory about government? Because libertarianism is generally a, seen as political philosophy about the proper role of the state. So these things that would happen, the state is going to set up yeah. this choice architecture. Yeah. So, so the way Sunstein and Thaler uh, defend it, 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 it depends. Uh, a lot of times there seems to be some kind of perhaps a government requirement in the background. So maybe governments require employers to to nudge people in this way, make this uh, make enrollment the default option. But uh, nudging can just refer to purely uh, private institutional mechanisms as well. It doesn't necessarily have to involve some kind of government uh, government uh, role. 
when you talk about the choice architecture, um, a lot of things that that I think about when I think about Nudge you, and Thaler and Sunstein talk about this stuff, just designing a supermarket shelf, for example, right? So you want people to buy more healthy food, so you put the healthy food at eye level, right? And on the other side, the the business was was putting maybe. Junk food there, but mm -hmm. something has to be at eye level. Yeah. So why not be healthy food, and that's better for everyone. That's a large part of the idea, right? Right, and so that's one of the main uh, defenses that uh, Sunstein and Thaler often give is they say, "Well, look, it's unavoidable that, that we're we're going to have to you know, you're going to have to put food somewhere, right? You're going to have to arrange the choice architecture in some way. So you might as well do it in a way that is more welfare conducive for the the target agent. Uh, so that's uh, often uh, times a, a defense they'll, they they will give uh, for for doing so. Yeah. Are they slipping in – I mean so they're calling it libertarian paternalism because they say all we're doing is influencing the choice architecture but we're leaving people's choices open. But what you're describing doesn't sound like that. It sounds like instead they just have pushed the coercion back a step because presumably the – say the guy organizing the supermarket shelves, if he was putting junk food up top as opposed to on the bottom, had a reason for doing that. I mean people don't tend to organize their supermarkets just totally randomly. They did it because maybe that sells better or whatever other reason. So we are restricting someone's choice and we are using coercion to do it. We're restricting the grocer's choice to organize his store the way he'd like to. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely uh, something that you, that, that's, that's something that w would, could be a, a possibility in terms of, of, under, of what, where is the level of coercion going on here. I think what Sunstein and Thaler are coming from though, they're, they're focusing more upon what is, what is happening to the, the, the consumer, the target agent. Uh, so uh, what you're doing to maybe either require or uh, or entice the the, um, the vendor to act in a certain way, I think it just sort of falls by the wayside in, in, in their discussion. They focus more upon the interaction between the um, you know the, the say the vendor and the customer. It seems like the the possible results of this could be incredibly beneficial, though, right? If you the, it might be marginal, right? If you it might just be five percent more purchasing of vegetables, but that could save us millions of dollars a year in healthcare costs. It might be 10 percent more savings for retirement funds, but that could save us another million dollars to make people happier in the future. With a bunch of little nudges, you could really make the world a happier place. For, well, from the standpoint of, of what, co uh, what saves costs, perhaps. Uh, I think the, the jury's still out on the, that empirical element of it. Uh, so um, you know, they're all, uh, on the other hand, there's the concern about, well, what if uh, people in fact this, – this is not what actually reflects their preferences. So if we're talking about – let me, let me backtrack a little bit. So uh, a lot of times uh, defenders of libertarian paternalism will say well, all we're trying to do is to nudge people in accordance with what their own preferences are. We're not trying to impose some kind of, of uh, you know, particular value on them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, Using these sort of insights from behavioral economics, uh, a lot of the defenders of libertarian paternalism will say, well, people have indeterminate preferences. Um, so uh, what we're going to try to do is then uh, intervene in a way that will be in accordance with what we presume their preferences would truly be if they weren't sort of beset by some of these irrational biases or these, uh, these heuristics that lead them astray. But the concern here is that we're actually perhaps overlooking what it is that people prefer uh, as opposed to uh, using these sort of proxies like health or wealth uh, as, as stand-ins. So to say that people might benefit from it, well, maybe from a cost-saving standpoint perhaps, if, if, if nudges cause people to act in, in healthier manner. I think that's an empirical matter. There's nothing I can really answer there from the armchair. Uh, but the question is, if we're really respecting people's preferences, we can't just assume that people want to act, you know, in the so-called healthier way or, or, or in the way that saves them more money. Uh, if in fact uh, the uh, the choice architecture is is, is leading them to uh, just sort of go with the flow and, and, and react in ways that not even, they're not even aware of. And so there, there's there's the, the well-being aspect, but there, on the other hand, there's also the concern with whether, whether we're respecting their autonomy at the same time. So. It, it sounds almost like a, a quantum mechanics theory of preferences. It's like they're indeterminate until they're 
they're observed or looked at in some way and then they coalesce around something. So all we're trying to do is to make them coalesce around different things. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's a really that's a really interesting way of putting it. I kind of think that's how we are though a lot of times. And if the behavioral economics literature is correct, that seems to be the case. We are not these uh, – you know, we're not homo economicus. We're not these sort of beings with this well-ordered set of, of stable ex ante preferences that uh, – you know, sustain across time. I mean, we we have to have some set of of stable preferences to have sort of a, you know a coherent self on some um, uh, minimal level. But to say that you know I I know precisely you know, or I should know precisely what my preferences are with regard to what I'm having for dessert tonight, it just doesn't seem like that's how we are. I mean, we we are boundedly rational for a good reason. Our heuristics are time savers and and resource savers because we don't have the uh, the capacity to. We don't have infinite processing ability. Uh, so the concern with maybe arranging choice architecture to steer people in certain ways is that uh, we're, we're in fact uh, – it's, it's somebody else's will or intention that's being imposed upon people without them even being aware of it. But we can we can ask people about their preferences, right? Mm-hmm. And and we'll find a fair amount of agreement on a lot of these things. So you look at the you know, New Year's resolutions that people make, and it's always I want to lose weight, I want to exercise more, I want all these aspirational things. And so if you were to ask people, I think, would you like to eat healthier than you do right now? Um, most people, nearly all people, would probably say yes, and they would mean it. Um, and and so what I'm wondering is, yeah. can we decouple? Because it seems to me like. If I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying, well, they sure they can say that, but their preferences in the moment when they're actually going to pick from the top shelf or the bottom shelf, the junk food or the vegetables, may change. We can't know their preferences until they actually express them in this quantum mechanics thing that Trevor did. But it it seems like is it possible to say, well, they can have a preference, but they don't have the capacity to say act on it. Like so that so the Greeks had this wonderful word acrasia, yeah. which was you know you you act against your own. You want something but you lack the willpower to mm-hmm. to act the way that you actually want to act, which is something that all of us have experienced. Yes. And so we do we could say we do know their preferences. They actually do want the vegetables, but when they go to the store, they're weak willed and their urge for chocolate takes over. So therefore we're not really we're not really stepping on their preferences. We're in fact helping yeah. them realize their actual preferences. Well, that could be that. That, that certainly can be the case. I, I don't. I don't want to deny the existence of, of acrasia. Uh, but what can be ambiguous in that regard is whether, at some point, uh, so. With regard to hyperbolic discounting, for instance, people people can have sort of intertemporal changes to their their, their how they discount the future. So yeah, acrasia is certainly a possibility, um, but. In some cases, it may be that somebody rationally changes their mind. They say, "I'm not. I, I really. I'm not going to have dessert tonight." And then, when they see the tiramisu, they decide, "I'm going to have it after all." Um, uh, so it may be ambiguous even to them whether, in fact, this is an acratic moment or a cratic moment or a uh, or a moment where they they are rationally changing their mind about their their short term uh, preferences and the trade offs uh, maybe with regard to the future. Uh, but then there's an added layer of complication because if somebody does that often enough, you say, okay, well, let's say you know this this guy he's always saying like I want I need to lose weight, I need to exercise, I'm going to you know not have dessert tonight, but always does otherwise, then there's some question about whether the stated preferences are actually his genuine preferences or he's, his actions are revealing his preferences. So there's all of these informational constraints that I think complicate matters uh, to, the, to the point where it's unclear in many instances whether in fact some given, say, intervention is uh, – is really tracking uh, a significant number of people's preferences if in fact their actions speak louder than what they're stating. And of course, economics has its own theory about how to discover people's preferences, namely what you do is, yeah. is, a, is a revelation of a revealed preference. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my favorite economic jokes is uh, the two economists who see a Porsche and one of them says, I want that and the other one says, obviously not. <laughs> because he's, he's just wanting something is not the that is not a preference. You need yeah. to be able to act on it, yeah. and that it reveals your preferences. Yeah. Um, now, is that problematic as a theory of preferences? 
Uh, well, I mean, I don't want to see on the one hand, I don't want to say that just whatever it is that you do reveals what you must want to do in that moment because like, OK, well, I just decide randomly I want to jump off a ledge. It must be what I wanted to do at that moment. I mean, that's it's sort of just then making uh, making rationality tautological. It's just whatever you do is whatever you do. Uh, so I don't really want to go down that rabbit hole. But at the same time, I think it makes sense to have conceptual space to say, well, maybe sometimes somebody is being weak-willed, being acratic. Maybe sometimes they're rationally changing their mind and maybe sometimes they're actions uh, are revealing what they they really prefer as opposed to what they say they want. That, that cheap talk is a thing. So I think all of those things, you can have space for all of those things without saying that, uh, OK, well, you know, it, it's, it's just uh, your, your actions just reveal what, what it is you really want moment to moment. So, um, you know, I know that maybe sounds like a cop out, but I, I think that the fact that all of those those options, all, all those possibilities, make sense. I, I reveal that the fact that there may be informational constraints on our ability to recognize our own, let alone other people's uh, preferences, understood subjectively, their, their well-being understood subjectively. And so, I think it complicates the question as to whether, in fact, uh, liber- say libertarian paternalism is really paternalistic in terms of serving their well-being. Uh, you can't just assume that making somebody, uh, you know, or, or Influencing somebody to make healthier or, or choices or, or more wealth conducive choices is in fact all things considered in alignment with what they understand their well-being to be in, a, in some reasonable way. So, Wouldn't the person who is choosing say rationally to have the extra dessert or to buy the junk food at the grocery store, I mean in this, in this libertarian paternalism setup that you've – You've given us where we are just kind of deciding the order that the choices that are presented to them and how they're presented to them, but we're not cutting off any particular choices. Then that person who rationally wants dessert and means to have it, all they have to do is bend down to the bottom shelf and pick mm-hmm. it up. Um, so we haven't really. I mean, what what problem have we caused? Mm-hmm. We haven't cut off their autonomy in any meaningful mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. But it does seem like we've helped the person who. Just through weakness of the will because that bending down is an extra step and maybe it offsets the weakness of the will mm-hmm. a little bit and they're, they're better off. So I don't – I guess I'm not seeing exactly in this example we're talking about here how this causes problems, how this limits the autonomy of the people who are choosing rationally. Yeah, OK. So uh, one way of thinking about it is that uh, people may often wish at, at, at the, the, the one of the, the main uh, concerns that I raise with with regard to arranging choice architecture is the fact that it, if if the if the effectiveness of the nudge relies upon its covertness, the fact that it's maybe going on behind the person's back, I think that is a a, a, a potential worry in terms of of compromising their autonomy, if not undermining it, because uh, what you're really doing in the situation is saying, okay, well, the person can't be trusted as a decision maker. They can't be trusted to decide whether or not they're going to make this, maybe by their own lights, rational or irrational decision. Uh, so, if I am, you know, if if I go to a, you know, if I if I'm in a cafeteria and unbeknownst to me. The choice architect is sort of hiding the desserts, and maybe I really don't. You know, I, I'm weak-willed. I don't. I don't want to have the desserts. But maybe as an autonomous chooser, I I want to be at least tempted and make the decision myself whether or not I'm going to have the dessert. I think that what raises a worry here is that if it's going on behind behind my back, I'm not really being treated as an autonomous decision maker. I'm being treated more as somebody who hopefully can, you know, can be steered one way or the other. Uh, and maybe you know, maybe that's beneficial to me, but there's still cost in terms of. Uh, Respecting me as as uh, as an autonomous decision maker, I that, think is that's interesting because yeah. in in, ch- in child situations with with yeah. actual children, with people who aren't full fledged adult citizens, yeah. there will be situations you say, you know, well, don't don't let her see it because if she sees it, she's going to want it. Yeah. So we're going to surreptitiously like hide the thing, whatever it is, a toy or a candy or something like that, because if she sees it, she's going to yell and scream about it, uh, and that seems treating them like a child. And if the government's doing that, yeah. if they don't even tell you that they're doing this, if they're just saying, well, no, yeah. this is now where the, the tiramisu is now on the bottom. Yeah. We haven't done anything. Then yeah. it seems to treat you like a child. Yeah. Yeah. I mean and like it could be that my – maybe I'm overstating this. Maybe my worries would go away if there were just like a sign or a placard that said, here's why we're hiding the tiramisu here. Uh, but I think that – Making the making the nudge overt in that way in many situations would would actually undermine its effectiveness, and so I, I think it, there's the, the worries arise when the defender of 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 a, of a particular nudge is sort of counting on people not to notice what's happening. There seems something 
screwy about that, I think at least. It's interesting though because it makes me think about, about businesses who are nudging us to yeah. all the time yeah. and we kind of expect for it to be happening. Uh, the, yeah. the, best, the best example I think is uh, Netflix. Netflix is constantly tracking so much data about what we actually do and then putting something up next right next to it because they have some correlation that shows there. And is it, is it better or worse that Netflix does that? I mean, do we know that they're doing that so it's not as big of a problem yeah, if government's doing it? You're right. It? It's a complicated question. I, I'm, I'm somebody who I, I – as long as there's sort of somebody intentionally trying to steer you in a way where they're counting upon your uh, your inattentiveness, I, I, I think there's a, at least a, a morally problematic thing that going on there. Maybe it's ultimately justifiable. Uh, maybe context, contextual as far as you know, your awareness that, that something's going on and then you're willing to still engage in the practice. So it is a complicated matter. I don't want to say, well, OK, it's, it's bad if governments are do, it, do it, but it's OK if, if private institutions do it because you know, the, example, the Netflix example, um, there's some evidence that certain colors in, uh, in you know, certain brand logos encourage people to purchase more. Well, if you know – if you kind of know this is going on, maybe it's OK then because you're just willing to take the risk that you're going to be nudged in particular ways. But I imagine that a lot of – in a lot of situations like Netflix maybe doesn't necessarily want you to know what they're doing. And I think that's sort of points to the worry that's going on as far as what may com be compromising your autonomy. Um, now, what to do about it? I'm a, I'm a philosopher. Maybe just wag your finger and say that's wrong. Don't you know? Stop doing that, or you know, boycott it if you don't like it, or whatever. I don't really know where to go from there, other than you know, I, I'll be satisfied if I can sort of point out some wrong making features of why that you know that that's going on. But I don't want to just say okay, well, um, since they're you know, since private institutions are doing it anyway, uh, it's always okay um, if people. Don't know what they're going on, what's going on, and uh, then they're not necessarily uh, making a, an informed decision to assume that risk. So, so what Netflix is doing is we, when we're talking about in the context of Netflix or other online inter internet things, we call it filtering, right? Like it's it's filtering what we're seeing and based on some set of criteria. And it occurs to me that even within the context of private filtering, there are certain kinds of filtering that we seem to think are perfectly fine. Like people don't tend to get upset at Netflix for showing you a certain set of movies except for when it obviously screws up and shows you totally weird things. And then we just laugh at it. We're not mad at it. Yeah. But there are other instances of filtering where we do get mad, right? Like the Facebook stuff. Like mm -hmm. people are always, you know, Facebook is is hiding things that I want to see and yeah. instead people are – the advertisers, they're showing me things that like they think advertisers are paying them for and you can pay to boost your exposure on Facebook and that makes us really mad. And I'm wondering – it seems like one thing that might distinguish these and might play into a problem with government doing this too um, is, is if we – I mean we – so let's go back to the grocery store example real quick. It seems less problematic if what the what we did with the grocery store example or other types of nudging was we asked you at a certain time, what are your preferences? Like do you want to lose weight? And then we set up filters in the grocery store um, to kind of help you along with that. So yes, you want to eat more vegetables. So we're going to put the vegetables in a more accessible spot. That would be less troubling. Or, Our, or those those uh, crazy websites where you write a check to some, yeah. some organization that you hate, yeah, right. like the NRA. Right. And if you don't lose fifty but, pounds, then they yeah, send that so, check to the. But NRA. what's going on there is that it's it's personalized filtering, mm -hmm. right? Like it's mm -hmm. your preferences being kind of re-expressed to you in a new way, which is kind of what goes on with the Netflix thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's it's based on what you've watched and it's personalized to you. Whereas what makes us mad at Facebook is it's non-personalized. It's representing the interests of another person. Yeah, yeah. And it feels like a lot of the problem with a government-based paternalism is it's not really going to be representing our own interests, right? It's either because it's just experts who think they can choose for us and for kind of epistemic humility reasons, like they just – they're not going to do a good job of it mm -hmm. or government is so beholden to special interests that want to promote their own interests at the expense of us that it yeah. may actually really be promoting their interests. Yeah. No, I think I think that's right. I think that uh, a lot of times what happens is that even if the intention of the of the choice architect is to influence people in a way that the choice architect thinks people really prefer, what ends up happening is that you have proxies like you know, well, make the nudge 
uh, in alignment with what will influence people to, to make health, you know, objectively healthier choices or objectively more wealth promoting choices. And that sort of papers over, I think, the complexity of the different trade off rates of, of people's you know, schedule values in their conception of the good because you know there's like a lot of different things that maybe I'm willing to trade off some level of health. Maybe uh, it helps me, you know, uh, going out to the bar with my friends, uh, companionship or, or autonomy or uh, just pleasure, things like that. That sort of there's, there's not really a way that you can uh, you know, have a um, uh, sort, sort of a, a, a default setting uh, with regard to that. It just becomes health or wealth becomes the proxy setting uh, that uh, you know the, the anchors on which the choice architects can can use their own particular uh, uh, motivation for saying, well, this is really what people probably want. So, right? does it, so. <laughs> it seems pretty disingenuous. Then, uh, well, it, have we? Kind of got to the point that it's disingenuous to call it libertarian paternalism in that sense because it, I, yeah, it does I mean, involve, co yeah. I mean, some sort of coercion, as Aaron pointed out, and some sort of other problems of government just constraining your choices like it's done before, but making it less clear. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I try, I, I try to be as charitable as I can and say, well, the, I mean, well, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way: I, I have a working paper right now that's rather cheekily titled libertarian paternalism is neither libertarian nor paternalistic. Uh, so that's the, the uncharitable uh, – sort of, I, I just sort of – that's the in-your-face in uncharitable title and then I immediately backtrack a little bit and say, well, you know, the, 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 in, the intention here I think is genuinely – I think Sunstein and Thaler genuinely think that they're trying to you – know, they, they're preserving people's choices with regard to nudges. Uh, but the worry here is that, well, if you, you – is it really – do you really have the freedom to opt out of a nudge if you don't know that, it, that it's happening? Right. If, if it's uh, if you're if you're counting on sort of somebody be, somebody's inattentiveness in order to influence them to act in a healthier way, then if they're not even aware of the opportunity to opt out, it doesn't really seem like like, like strictly speaking, there is the freedom to opt out. But as a matter of practical rationality, are they aware of that? Do they have that freedom to opt out if they're you know if they're not aware of it? Uh, so. It depends upon what I guess what angle you take. Like you know, maybe metaphysically speaking, it is libertarian because you're not actually removing their freedom of choice uh, as you would be through, say, a directly coercive mechanism. But if they're not being, uh, if they're not aware of of the uh, of what's going on, then it's not clear to me that it, it really is uh, a matter of preserving uh, their freedom because. If, if, if it's not coercive, it's at least manipulative. It also seems like you'd have to almost assert – well, you wouldn't have to almost assert, but you'd have to play with the idea of whether or not it could ever be rational to be fat or to smoke right, or to skydive, uh, yeah. things that could create social cost. Um, and if you don't leave that up to a person, an individual person, then you say, well, this actually that person got so much pleasure out of food yeah. that they got way more pleasure yeah. than the cost of them being fat. So it, it doesn't seem too far away to say, OK, there could be you know, really liking food, being I mean, becoming obese. Somebody can say, I really like that. The obesity is the cost I'm willing to pay for for uh, my indulgence. Uh, I really, you know, people may really like smoking. Um, you know, I, I, as an ex-smoker, I used to really like smoking, and I, you know, I, I quit smoking for various reasons. But I can think it wasn't insane of me to make those decisions. It wasn't irrational. Uh, maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm rationalizing what I did, but it, it didn't seem clearly to be something that I really didn't want to do at the time. So I think it's easy to say, well, of course, the healthier choice is what people should prefer if they had these, you know, unlimited processing abilities and, and, and unlimited information and, and things like that. But that's just that's making that's making normative assumptions in the place of um, you know, assuming that that we should be rational in some kind of idealized, really idealized sense. But what about cost to others? Because a lot of the choices that we make have cost right. to others, and so we cut them off. So we like, yeah. drunk driving, right? You might say, "Well, I I happen to get a lot of pleasure out mm -hmm. of drunk driving." Mm -hmm. And we say, "Well, so yeah. what? The damages that you would potentially do." Absolutely. And and so a lot of these things we're talking about, like healthy eating or retirement accounts. Part of the argument for them is not like, "Well, you're going to hurt yourself." Yeah. It's we're going to have to bear the costs right. for you making these poor decisions, so we should have some say over right, what you can right. Tell you. And actually, that that's sort of I think a lot of that is going on in the background, uh, either with Sunstein and Thaler or with other defenders, or you know, Mayor Bloomberg during his tenure it was it, it was often a, a pecuniary externality argument. That's a mouthful to say, uh, but sort of the notion that you know people's unhealthy decisions either is going to raise other people's insurance rates, or if it's you know if there's some kind of uh, 
public safety net, then that's going to raise costs for other people. So that's you know that's a whole angle. I actually don't. I'm not. I that's an interesting angle. I'm not going into that in this paper that I'm working on right now, but I think that's an important question. Um, you know, sort of the easy, maybe the easy way, the too easy way out, the hand wavy uh, approach is to say, well, ultimately that sort of safety net is itself a paternalistic. Uh, motivation. So somebody who says, well, we're not really making a paternalistic argument when we say we should nudge people or coerce them in order to, to save taxpayer money or what have you. Uh, I think ultimately, well, why is there that safety net beyond just maybe what's a matter of, uh, you know, person's own, uh, you know, if, 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 if you know, say, there's a, there, there can be safety nets for for uh, to help people for reasons that they didn't have control over, or, you know, beyond that's uh, not a matter of their own culpability. But if the safety nets extended to include uh, people's culpable choices, uh, then that's ultimately, I think, maybe a question begging argument on the part of the paternalists because the argument is, well, we have to save people from themselves, and so we should restrict their liberties in order to keep them from making us pay for them uh, in the long run. I don't know if that came out clearly. What I, what yeah, I, what well, I, I think said, you're, but... you're making a point about <laughs> about culpability yeah. in general because yeah. this is a conversation we've been having. Both politically and then in the psychology community, everything for for hundreds of years now, but especially in the, in the 20th century and the early part of the 21st century, this question of what are you culpable for? And a lot of a lot of words, a lot of studies have been put into claims that obesity is an addiction, mm -hmm. that you know, getting uh, beating your wife is an addiction, you know, criminal making these defenses in criminal matters, yeah. and and all these they seem very tied to having. A safety net because mm -hmm. as soon as there's a safety net, people are could be predating off of it, and so one way you say, well, you know, yeah, he's obese and he could be predating off the healthcare system, but obesity is a condition, not a choice, and then all of a sudden, it's just paternalism all over again. But we're but you're not making choices, so we're not actually taking away choices mm -hmm. because your obesity wasn't a choice in the first yeah, place. Yeah, and I mean, I you know, I'm from the armchair. I can't really speak to that. I mean, I'm willing to bite the bullet if it turns out that our best theory of addiction is that it's not your choice in any meaningful sense. Then. I, I'm willing to say that. Okay, then that's a, sort of a, a realm that's not a, that's not a matter of autonomy. It's a matter of something that maybe is like a disease or or, or something along those lines. I know personally, I'm not ready to like uh, buy into that 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 view uh, uh, just yet. Just I think it's easy to just say the devil made me do it, but that's that's me from the armchair. So again, like I'll say, like if, you know, if if the best theory of of uh, addiction says people can't help the way they act, then and I'll have to go. Yeah, I'll have to go with it. Yeah, <laughs> but do we have to? Do we have to define autonomy now? Mm -hmm. Is the, is the burden on us to define what an autonomous choice is? Uh, with all the pressures to say yeah. that there isn't such thing as an autonomous well, choice. And that, 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 so what complicates matters as well is that I, 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 I've been talking about autonomy sort of in terms of free choice, uh, which I think is one view of autonomy or one aspect of it. But I don't necessarily think that exhausts the, con the conception of autonomy one can have. I mean another view of autonomy, not, not inconsistent with one that uh, it has to do with freedom of choice, is that well – well, maybe it's somewhat inconsistent. But it, it could say, well, even if – you know free choice is somehow a myth or, or what have you, uh, there's a distinction between being, say, necessitated by one's own internal uh, preferences or, or, or uh, psychological elements and being controlled by an external sort of uh, for someone else's will. So even if my own choices are necessitated by my own sort of inner psychology, that could still be a matter of, of authenticity, a matter of autonomy in this sort of restricted, maybe compatibilist sense, if you will, that people may prefer to have as opposed to being controlled either overtly or unwittingly by somebody else's uh, exercise of, of will. So um, even you – know, even if free choice is a myth, I think that we can. We, there's still a notion of autonomy out there that it can can be used as a potential defeater of a, a lot of these arguments for for why we should have you know, a, a wide array of of in, intentional uh, choice architecture. So, is if this is if the voters choose the libertarian paternalist route, and so they're choosing it in advance, is that? An exercise of autonomy because so they're binding themselves in the same way that so like Odysseus having his sailors <laughs> tie him to the mast, you know, like that. It would we wouldn't say that then once he was tied to the mast, he and wanted to be free, he had lost autonomy because he actually had said in advance, like I really I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to want 
to get away but I really shouldn't and you need to tie me up. So the voters doing the same thing. The voters read the, the Sunstein book and say, yeah, that sounds pretty good. I want to vote for people who are going to urge me to eat healthily um, no matter what my future self happens to say. Well, if it's a unanimous vote, then yeah, I think that's perfectly <laughs> fine. But that, that there's the whole problem with democracy, right? It's the, it's those people who, you know, the majority of people who don't vote at all, or you know, even if there is a hundred percent turnout, the 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 minority on that side of the issue then uh, isn't necessarily uh, autonomous in any meaningful sense, at least. So I think. <laughs> well, they're, they're not, you could vote. You could say I'm just voting to impose this on myself. Which yeah. you said going back in that that kind of self choice architecture has autonomy to it, like writing a check to a political organization you hate, and if you don't lose weight, yeah. you know, that's that's tying yourself to the mast in some way, right? Yeah, but, but really in the process, you're tying about, other people to the mast as well, exactly. maybe without them without them uh, signing on to it. Yeah, so, you know. vote, and so voting is also, and that's of course goes back to the cost thing. Uh, well, these healthcare costs are becoming a problem. Yeah. These uh, retirement account costs, the poor old people, whatever people who don't yeah. save for retirement, they're becoming a problem. Yeah. Uh, and and that's the other argument that comes into play. If you think about what Social Security was argued for when it was first passed, it was it was unwise older people who weren't saving for their retirement. Mm -hmm. Now we argue for empowering people like we at the Cato Institute and Libertarians arguing to empower people to save for their own retirement, but there still will be someone who doesn't do it. So in terms of trying to catch that person who falls through the cracks, is libertarian paternalism preferable to the straight social security exaction? Yeah, I mean that's a tough question as far as what like what maybe is empirically the best uh, policy approach. I mean, I'm I'm kind of a I'm I'm a you know, I'm 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 kind of a, a, a diet libertarian when it comes to this. I'm somewhat sympathetic to like a universal uh, basic income, unconditional basic income. That I think you know at least at the very you know at the very least you can. You know, if if uh, I'm I'm not opposed to that in principle. Maybe it doesn't work. Uh, maybe there's all kinds of reasons to think it doesn't work. But I think that. If it comes down to a, a trade-off between like any you know, er erosion of, of, of personal liberties versus uh, a safety net, I kind of you know I, I incline toward the liberties. Uh, you know, if if the safety net requires us to have all these conditions on what people do, like you know you need to get permission to order a pizza, if when it gets to that point, if it you know, already isn't in some degree to that point, then I think that's what raises uh, all, all kinds of worries. So yeah, I mean, and what's empirically the best way to go about that? I'm not sure, but as far as far as um, you know, uh, libertarian paternalism versus uh, social security, I don't like either of those options. <laughs> to be honest, well, we have, we <laughs> is there a third way? <laughs> we didn't even bring up the yeah. the slippery slope because yeah. that's what you just brought. Um, the slippery slope here is huge. It's it, the slippery slope for social security is, I guess, more people having it and the check being bigger. The slippery slope for endorsing libertarian paternalism is Brave New World. Yeah, or, what, or well, demolition what, man. What, what, in, what in principle would not be a potential pecuniary externality? Like, uh, you know, you don't exercise enough. You know, get up, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I, and maybe that's uh, facile to, to, to say, but uh, like, there's nothing in principle that would prevent there being all kinds of added restrictions to what people can do in the name of protecting them for giving them a protection that maybe they would rather opt out of. Well, I, Talking I, about opting out, right? Yeah. And that slippery slope seems particularly slippery if you write that the the libertarian paternalists aren't really thinking about the restrictions on the providers but instead just the consumers mm -hmm. because we don't tend to think of a lack of – like if choices don't exist, it's not a restriction on my autonomy, right? So we don't like – it's you know I would love it if – um, you could fly. If I could fly or if, if there were some company out there that was providing me with this imaginary product that I think would be totally awesome. But the fact that there isn't that company isn't like a restriction on my autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, the but iPhone if, 7, the lack of the iPhone 7 right, like, yeah. Yeah, so, is not so a restriction. If, if, the, if we aren't considering it coercion, we're not considering it a problem to restrict what the providers can provide – Right, so we we you know by saying you have to order your shelf in this way, or you can't you know you can't do the huge sodas um, as a libertarian paternalist thing because then people won't buy them. Um, then then that seems to open us up to pretty much restricting everything because everything we get comes from providers to mm -hmm. some degree. Yeah, no, I agree. And of course, the slippery soap problem is particularly pronounced when. There is no limiting principle. If the principle that they're articulating can be applied to anything going forward and at no point will they be like, well, no, stop. This is 
too far. You, you, you're now yeah. you're meddling too much in people's lives and yeah. people's choices. And there's nothing about libertarian paternalism exactly that would have that happen. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, so there's some really good articles on this by Mario Rizzo and Glenn Whitman about uh, sort of the institutional, sort of pu public choicey kinds of arguments about well, you know, even if Sunstein and Thaler, we take them at their word that hey, we're just trying to have this sort of fairly moderate, gentle set of nudges. Uh, that's not; they're not the ones necessarily. Uh, they're not the policymakers. They're not the voters. They're not the bureaucrats who are enforcing these mechanisms. And so, once you have that, uh, when, when, you know, those people uh, in control of, of making these kinds of decisions, uh, there's possibly a lack of accountability. Uh, there's uh, and there's no necessarily uh, there's, there's not necessarily a concern on the part of those people that what they're doing is still respectful of you know, respectful enough of people's. Freedom of choice, and, so. and there's lack of, of the, the possibility of abusing it in a specific way that government abuses things, particularly in the big soda instance in New York City. Yeah. You know, everyone was always saying, "Well, why didn't you attack Starbucks drinks? Starbucks drinks that are five times the calories." And it seemed like the answer to that question was because poor people drink soda, and soda is on the outs outs right now mm -hmm. for for people who are more well to do and more well to do people make laws, and they are more likely to go to Starbucks and get a caramel double macchiato, whatever, and less likely to get a big gulp. Um, and th and now you just have pure self interest becoming part of the choice architecture system and that's yeah. the exact kind of danger we should be concerned with as libertarians. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree as well. I mean, I, and I don't, I don't necessarily go into these arguments and what I'm working on because I think other people have made them uh, better than I really have anything to add to. But yeah, I think that as far as just a, a, just a practical policy matter, that's definitely a concern. My focus is upstream of that. You know, even if somehow we can magically implement these in ways that are – would not be you – know, befall a, a potential for abuse or slippery slopes, I still think there's, there's worries upstream about what is it that we're doing now, these so-called moderate gentle nudges uh, in terms of in fact, are they actually respecting people uh, – respecting people's autonomy? Are they genuinely tracking uh, people's well-being? And it's, it's the verdict the, – the verdict's far from clear uh, in, in those regards. So. So you've defined paternalism and libertarian paternalism and said it's bad um, and you've talked about it as this you – know, we're, we're organizing the choice architecture. We're saying which choices are on the table or what order you can approach them in. We can make some choices easier to access than others and that that's cutting off people's autonomy. But isn't that what libertarianism itself is? Like we're, we're saying you know, there are certain things like you might want to choose a state that can do these things but you can't yeah. um, and you might want to – wander around gathering up this property but you can't because we've coordinated off as private property in these certain ways and we've set up all these rules and you can't choose these things and on top of that, trust us, you'll you'll be better off with these things than if you didn't have them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, so um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question and uh, this is going to maybe sound like hand-waving here but uh, I, you know, I don't think that there's anything wrong per se with coercion. I don't think there's anything wrong per se with manipulation. Uh, I sort of take a – what's so-called justificatory liberal approach that our liberal polity uh, that employs coercion, which I think inevitably we do and perhaps uh, employs manipulation, these things uh, – are not per se bad. Some people I think view coercion or manipulation as inherently pejorative. It's like, okay, well, that's coercive. Therefore, it's wrong. Not if it's justified. Now, what does that mean to be justified? Whole big debate about what that can involve. And then there's, a whole, you know, there's nothing that I'm going to be able to say here that will be satisfactory other than something having to do with the coercion and its rationale or the manipulation and its rationale being in alignment with the uh, – Sort of the values and, and, and preferences of the people who would stand to that stand to be coerced or stand to be manipulated. That's a very broad uh, uh, way of approaching it. But you know, if a libertarian polity, we can tell a story about why that it's just why it, you know some particular say property right restriction is justified because uh, it's better off for all of us to act that way. Uh, we can sort of help get along with each other uh, better than some uh, nearby alternative. Then we can if we can tell a story about why that's justified to everybody, even if. Somebody doesn't actually assent to it, but we can point out to say, well, given your values and your preferences and your beliefs, you should endorse this particular restriction. Even if it's not your favorite restriction, it's better than say some you know, no agreement point. Then I think we can tell a story about why ultimately it's justified. So I don't want to say libertarian paternalism I, – I, you know, if, if I've come across as saying that libertarian paternalism is 
wrong full stop. I, I, I want to say no. It's wrong if it's not justified to this or that particular person who is maybe you know, unwittingly uh, uh, influenced by it. So some people will be perfectly – will find libertarian paternalism perfectly justified. There's a way to sort of interact with them without uh, you know, imposing it on those who, who, to whom it's not justified. Then uh, that's fine. Uh, if there's some story we can tell about how a, a given scheme of property rights is justifiable to everybody who would be uh, you know, un, under that, that course of scheme, then – we can tell a story, and then, then there, you know, then <laughs> it's, you know, it seems we, that we can we can run with it. The, Easier said than done. That's where all the devil in the details is. But yeah, you know. it seems that in that, in that, in the way you describe it, there we could almost be saying if we're trying to minimize some of these paternalism negative aspects or negative coercion, that if we want to say that property rights are paternalistic. Um, I guess I'll grant that for some purposes, but the libertarian society should not be – government should not be something where people are just competing about who can best paternalize the other group as long as they're in power. Yeah. It should be something where there's more yeah. more areas where you can you can create your own paternalism for yeah. your own interests yeah. such as you can run well, your household uh, 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 in your way that you want to uh, and your yeah. town in your exactly. way you want and, and to. Especially if – you need some kind of a property right in order to realize your autonomy better than some alternative like a Hobbesian anarchy or what have you. Then, yeah, I mean, uh, this is sort of you know we're, we're not talking about idealization here. We are inherently social beings, and so uh, the property rights are sort of demands that we make on one another to give each other space, so that we can act however we choose, live our lives as we see fit. Uh, that, to me, I think is a precondition for autonomy rather than sort of this ex ante. Uh, paternalistic uh, imposition. I think it's a precondition for being free from paternalism, <laughs> you know, as much as possible. Since we aren't these, you know, brains in a vat or these Cartesian sort of inherently, you know, uh, atomistic beings that have no uh, sort of can, can just go about ourselves uh, independently of one another. Um, you know, we wouldn't need property rights, I think, if we were perfectly atomistic and could just like be protected from one another. So. so in conclusion, it seems that uh, we've gone a lot of different directions in this conversation, but libertarian paternalism is not very libertarian. It sometimes is, isn't even paternalistic and in general not a good idea. Yes. So I think that libertarian paternalism is, is not typically libertarian insofar as even if it strictly speaking preserves a person's uh, freedom of choice, doesn't forbid them options insofar as it counts on people not not being aware of the particular intervention going on. It doesn't really uh, reflect a respect for them as autonomous decision makers. Instead, it sort of relies upon exploiting people's cognitive biases or heuristics to steer them to act in particular ways that maybe don't reflect either their own preferences or how they would wish to be treated with regard to uh, going about correcting their own pref uh, their own actions in light of perhaps um, you know acrasia or, or, or other sorts of uh, um, complications with regard to their preferences. It's not really paternalistic in a lot of cases. Insofar as we understand paternalism as a success term, insofar as we understand paternalism as actually helping people uh, to act in alignment with their own well-being broadly construed because I think in lots of cases, people uh, you know, we, people having indeterminate preferences, it's not necessarily clear whether a particular choice architecture scheme is in alignment with what people really value, a variety of different preferences that, that they can have. So um, you know, given the informational constraints we have uh, with regard to whether somebody is, is weak-willed or whether in fact they're changing their mind or whether in fact they're just paying lip service to some particular wealth-conducive or health-conducive uh, activity or in fact whether they value something else, there's a lot of complications there that make it, I think, too e it's, it's, it, it's too easy just to assume that some particular intervention is in fact uh, genuinely conducive to a person's well-being. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.